Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, It's About Time, PNT Challenges and Benefits of Multi-Constellation and Multi-Signal GNSS, brought to you by GPS World and our sponsor of the event, Talisman. Talisman is a developer, manufacturer, and provider of GNSS, Iridium, and Global Star antennas and accessories in support of customers who are engaged in a broad range of satellite-based positioning, navigation, and data applications. I'm Mackenzie Schoner from North Coast Media, content marketing producer for GPS World, and I will be the moderator for today's event. Before we get started, I want to let you know that today's webinar will be recorded. You are currently in a listen-only mode. A recording of this webinar will be posted to gpsworld.com slash webinars and will also be emailed to you tomorrow. At this time, I'd like to acquaint you with the ways in which you can participate during today's presentation. Please notice the Q&A panel at the left-hand side of your console. If you have a question, type it into the panel's text box, then click Submit to place your question in queue. We encourage you to ask any and all questions you may have for our speakers during the presentation. We will address these questions at the end of the presentation during the Q&A portion. Questions submitted during registration have already gone to our panelists and may be covered during the presentation. If you experience any technical difficulties during today's event, you may use the same Q&A panel on your screen to submit your issue, and Assistant Producer Aurora Harris or I will personally assist you. You may learn more about our speakers by viewing their photo, bio, and email address in the panel located on the upper left-hand side of your console. If you are logged into your social media accounts, you can share the webinar's title, description, and URL with your friends or colleagues using the Share This widget you'll see at the bottom left corner of the screen. You may download a version of the slides from today's presentation and the Resources widget, as well as access to the Talisman website and the GPS World website. Now I'd like to introduce you to today's presenters. We will be hearing from Julian Hutker, Director of GNSS Product R&D for Talisman Wireless. After a four-year postdoctoral training, Julian joined Talisman Wireless in Ottawa, Canada as an antenna and RF engineer and is now the Director of GNSS Product R&D. We will also be hearing from John Fisher, VP of Advanced R&D for Aurolia. For almost 20 years, John has been working with global navigation satellite systems, wireless position, positioning, navigation, and timing, and specialized systems for customers at Aurolia. We will also be hearing from Sunil Biznath, Professor of Geometric Engineering at York University. For over 25 years, Sunil has been actively researching precise GNSS-focused positioning and navigation solutions and applications. At this time, I'll turn the presentation over to Sunil. Take it away. Thanks, Mackenzie, and hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us um, on this uh, webinar. Um, hopefully, you'll find lots of inf interesting information um, from our uh, three talks, and we look forward to taking your questions. So I'll focus on the P and the N part of this uh, um, webinar, and, uh, and John will follow me talking uh, much more about timing. So first of all, just a few words about um, York University and our lab. Uh, York University is in uh, Toronto, Canada. It's the nation's third largest university with about 55,000 students and over 7,000 faculty and staff, um, and we just Try not to get confused with the University of York, which is in the uh, UK. Uh, the GNSS lab was established in 2006 by myself uh, within the geomatics engineering program. And we focus on GNSS uh, measurement processing, sensor fusion, uh, software and hardware receiver design, and uh, many scientific engineering and um, mass market applications. And our people, as you can see by our logo, really, um, really are our strength. So in, in terms of um, GNSSs, um, currently we have, of course, GPS, uh, the standard bearer, uh, GLONASS that has been with us 
soon after the introduction of GPS. Uh, newer systems include um, Beto uh, or BDS um, and Gal from China and Galileo from um, the European Union. We currently also have a number of regional systems, the regional version of, uh, of Beto uh, tend to be referred to as BDS2, uh, the QZSS system from Japan and Navic um, from uh, India. Um, and I say current because there are plans for potentially other additional satellite navigation systems. Uh, what does this mean? Well, uh, this means if we were at, to add up all the medium Earth orbiters that are the satellites from these constellations that orbit the globe, as well as the geostationary and uh, um, geosynchronous satellites, we have over 132. Uh, we have 132. Um, which is, is quite a significant number. Uh, however, I would focus on just the MEO, the medium Earth orbiters in, in this talk, because these are the satellites that everyone around the world sees. And we are now in a situation where we have over 100 global uh, navigation satellites. So it's, it's quite a milestone. So what does this mean in terms of the effect of multi-GNSS on terrestrial users? Well, first, let's take a look at uh, satellite availability. So what we have in these plots are the number of satellites that are visible on average over a day. Um, if we were looking at all the satellites 10 degrees above the elevation uh, horizon and beyond. And at the top left, what we see is, is um, uh, GPS, and then we keep adding constellations. Uh, so the warmer the figures get, the higher the number. And the range here on the scale is 0 to 40 satellites. and um, so zero in, in dark blue and, and uh, 40 in bright yellow. So with GPS, what we see is, um, you know, a nice global coverage of between five and 10 satellites. When we add GLONASS, that number jumps um, up into the, the high teens. Um, when we add Galileo, we're already at the, the, the two dozen or so satellite uh, level, and by adding uh, BDS 2 and 3, what we see globally is um, up in around 30 satellites that we can observe at any given time and all the way up to over 40 in the, in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, so multi-GNSS really has a huge impact on satellite availability. If we go dig a little further and look at the impact on measurement geometry. So that's the geometry between the, the satellites and the and the, the user on, on the ground. We can use PDOP, for example, position dilution of precision as a, as a good measure, which is a unitless uh, number. And in this case, the range is from zero to about three. And uh, it, the, it's an inverted scale. So the lower the number is, the more precise we would expect our measurements. And what we see with GPS, um, you know, a fairly good uh, PDOP. Um, it, it's a little lower I, uh, uh, at the poles, as, as we'd expect because of the geometry. Um, but about two, two and a half. We add GLONASS, that number goes down by about 0.5. We add Galileo, goes down another 0.5 or more. And by the time we have, are using all four constellations, the PDOP is way down to uh, about 0.5 or so. So tremendous improvement in measurement geometry by using multiple constellations. Another way to look at this is, is through satellite visibility plots, so the sky plots as we call them. These are polar plots. Um, this one happens to be a particular location uh, where I am in, in Toronto, Canada. And what we have in the four figures are the uh, locations, the elevation angles, and the azimuths of the satellites that we'd observe um, uh, above 10 degrees. Um, so GPS, then we add GLONASS at the top right um, in red, we add Galileo at the bottom left in yellow, then we add Beidou at the bottom right in purple, and we can see as we layer the constellations one on top of the other, um, just the huge increase in the number of satellites. So this really does help when we have, for example, obstructions like bu buildings, etc. Um, the more satellites we have, um, unless the obstructions are ubiquitous, um, we, we can see nice improvements. So let's move on to the signals. For um, 
uh, for many, many years, most users were single frequency users and their options were limited. It was GPS L1 or the GLONASS um, uh, frequency. Um, during that time, performance users had uh, the option of dual frequency uh, receivers and, and antennas. And, and so they would able, be able to track signals from GLONASS and GPS on L2 slash G2. Um, that has since changed. Those days are um, way behind us. And in our multi um, constellation, multi signal world, we see um, something like this, where we've added uh, uh, the um, Galileo signals, we've added the Beto signals. There are more than two. What I've done in this figure um, is I've uh, basically color coded um, the, the signals into, into four bands. Uh, we also have, I, I should have mentioned, the frequency, the bandwidth, wavelength, and the, the code modulations that are on top. So um, it, we end up with a, a plethora of signals and frequent uh, and modulations that we can make use of. Um, a word about the, the strength of the signals. Uh, here we have, for those constellations and modulations that are uh, publicly available, the minimum specified receiver power in dB watts uh, f from those constellations. Um, and what we can see is that, given that that is a, a log scale, is we can see um, you know, um, the strength of the signals, and it gives us an indication of our ability to acquire and track those signals. Uh, the one standout it really is GPSL5, and, and that's for two different models that we see there, and we see um, a significantly stronger power. So what are the challenges then, given that we have all of these constellations and we have all of these signals? Um, well, we can look at the, the there are many, um, but we can, we can categorize them into sort of two components. One, in terms of signal processing. So our antennas have to change, um, and Julian will um, give you a really good presentation on antennas soon. So we, we will need to we need to expand to the multiband sensitivity of these antennas, and then we have to deal with the out of band interference and suppress that. So we want to accept more, and we need to constrict what we accept. On the receiver side, we have to deal with the with signal compatibility and the interoperability between the signals, between constellations. Um, so a much more complex receiver. Uh, we have to deal with signal interference, jamming, and spoofing. Um, and there are pros and cons there, uh, which some of which John will talk about. Um, and then we have to deal with the limited processing power on the receiver chips. If we're going to track many more constellations, many more frequencies, how do we manage that? Then, on the measurement processing side, we have an analogous set of issues to deal with. We have variations in the reference systems between the constellations. So these are the spatial reference systems, for example, different reference ellipsoids being used by different constellations, um, different uh, temporal or time systems that are being used by, by the different constellations. And so the user processing software has to account for these spatial and temporal offsets, um, and they can be as many as um, tens of meters in magnitude uh, if we don't. Also, there are many signal biases um, between modulations on a signal, between um, signals or frequencies on a constellation, and between constellations, such as differential code biases or DCBs, satellite group delays, and other biases. And again, so again, the user processing software must account for these biases as they can have centimeter to meter magnitudes over time. Some of them are, are more stationary, others uh, drift over time. So without accounting for these, um, we would have problems in terms of combining the measurements from different constellations. So uh, let's take a little uh, deeper look. So in this figure, we're showing, we're trying to illustrate the effect of signal obstructions on multi-GNSS. And what we have here is a global PDOP, that is a set of global stations and the average PDOP um, that we would see with different elevation masking. 
Uh, and what we have in uh, the top, uh, top left figure is the situation for GPS when there's a 10 degree, 20, 30, and then 40 degree elevation mass. And these are histograms. So what we see uh, on that top left figure are the number of occurrences um, of a particular PDOP value ranging between 0 and 20, again, where the, the lower the number is, the more precise the positioning would be. And uh, what we see is as we raise the elevation mask in the top left from 10 uh, degrees all the way up to 40, uh, what we see is that the, the um, PDOPs get worse. So our, our expected solution gets worse because our geometry gets worse because we're using fewer and fewer um, satellites. There's more and more blockage. Is, is what we're simulating. Well, what happens when we add, for example, uh, GLONASS and we use R, G for GLONASS, R for, 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 for sorry, G for GPS, R for GLONASS, E for uh, Galileo, and C um, for um, Beidou um, following a, a particular convention, so G, R, E, C. Well, when we add R, that's GLONASS, to the top right figure, what we see is the histogram shift to the left. It, the PDOP becomes more precise. Um, when at the bottom left, when we add um, Galileo, we see a further shift to the left. And by the time we get to the bottom right figure with the four constellations, we see much, much better f performance and a further shift to the left. So adding constellations can help us deal with signal obstructions. And in the table we have there, what we see is, uh, I use the example with the two yellow, the two, sorry, green circles that if we had a, a mask of 10 degrees, a blockage of 10 degrees, and we had just GPS and GLONASS, we would have a, um, an average PDOP of about 1.4, which would be very similar to if we had a 20 degree elevation mass, so a bigger blockage, and we have four constellations. So having the four constellations would give us a performance similar to the two if we had a bigger obstruction. Uh, more telling are the, the, the blue circles. A GPS with a 10 degree mask, well, what happens if we had a 30-degree mask? Well, if we had all four constellations, we'd get almost similar uh, geometry. Um, uh, so we could have a much bigger obstruction and, and do reasonably well with the four constellations versus the one. Okay, so let's take a look at some positioning results. Um, what we've uh, done here, uh, one of the areas our lab focuses on a lot is precise point positioning, or PPP which is a wide area augmentation processing technique that doesn't require local calibration or, or reference station. The major limitation for PPP is the time for initial convergence, which could, um, it could take tens of minutes to get um, from meter level down to centimeter level or better. So what we've done here is taken one week of global stationary geodetic data, so high performance antennas and receivers that are static and we process them in kinematic mode, so we assumed they were kinematic, and we define convergence as the time it takes to get to 10 centimeter uh, horizontal error. So, um, and we've put in the 95 percentile results here, and I should point out we're not including uh, BDS3 in, in this particular solution. And what we've done is we've produced the, what are called the float ambiguity solutions. These are the carrier solution, carrier phase solutions um, that are floating point estimates, and we've also then been when we're able to fix them. And what we see is, uh, with um, in the figure at the bottom left, is it takes about 15 minutes with GPS only uh, to get to this this level of precision. And if we fix, we get down to less than 10 10, um, 10 minutes it takes to get there. And when we add constellations. Uh, we see improvement. So adding the constellations allows us to have better float solutions and better fixed solutions, all the way down to about five minutes to get the solution, which is not quite RTK performance, but it's getting there. Um, but these are dual frequency results, which is um, which leads us to the next my, the next slide. What happens? These are the four constellations. What happens if we take now, go from one to four constellations, but now add additional um, uh, frequencies. And what we see in, in this figure is a slightly different data set, and we are including the BDS3, uh, again, 95% results. And what we see is that there's huge improvement in the fixing by adding um, constellations. So dual frequency, three and a half minutes to get to that convergence, 
triple, we go down to two and a half minutes, and quadruple where it's available, and in this case, it's, it's really the Galileo satellites, um, because we weren't able to get the corrections for the fourth frequency in BDS-3, one minute. So pretty close to instantaneous convergence uh, by the time we get up to the fourth frequency in, in PPP. Um, and you are starting to see products and services out there that um, have such tremendous performance. So in conclusion, challenges? Yes, there are challenges in terms of hardware and software design, uh, but these changes are being met, and you'll hear more about them in this webinar. Benefits? There, there is a, a, a great, great list of benefits in, in terms of accuracy, availability, integrity, and resilience, and these are very significant benefits. So with that, I'd like to end my portion of the webinar and pass things over to John. John? Thank you, Sunil. That was great. And, and um, as you said, um, you'd focused on position and navigation. So I'm going to uh, focus on timing, timing applications and the challenges and benefits of this multi-constellation, multi-frequency uh, capability that's emerging. So. Um, let me get started. Oh, but be, first, before I start, um, let me just tell you a little bit about Arolia. If you don't know us, uh, of course, uh, we are uh, very involved in timing and synchronization systems. We make uh, atomic clocks. And, uh, all the atomic clocks, for example, in, in the Galileo system are made by Arolia. Um, but we also do more. We do test and simulation of GNSS uh, things. We even do... Um, uh, search and rescue emergency beacons for aircraft, for ships, and uh, all kinds of customs uh, solutions. So uh, working in uh, aerospace, defense, uh, commercial markets, uh, any, any place where there's a, a critical need of where you, where, you have a, a, where you have a PTP solution that you can trust. So that's what I, we do. So enough about us. Let's go into um, a little... Um, a history of timekeeping and, and its relationship to, to navigation. So uh, I'm going to go back in time a little bit here. So a little little bit of history first. Um, the I'm going to start with the fact that how, how was centuries ago, how was navigation done? Uh, done by uh, as soon as you got out into the seas where you no longer had land reference points, no landmarks to, to look at, um, you used the stars. And so you'd map out the stars when you knew where you were, so that then, as as it varied over uh, over the year, as the as the Earth revolved around the sun, you know, you'd have a map of the stars. You'd know where you are, and you'd be able to determine where you are on Earth. Um, that worked fine for latitude, um, but as we all know, the the Earth spins. So, um, and it's spinning at approximately, depending on your latitude, uh, three to 400 meters per second. And so now, uh, unless you know what time it is, you know, within, with, you know, less than a second, you're not going to, you're not going to know your position very well. And so, um, you know, that uh, was, a, was a bit of a problem, uh, and especially when global navigation started to become popular in the 16th century after you know, Columbus, Magellan, and 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 all of uh, all of those folks started to navigate all around the world, and they they needed to do this this navigation, and, and that was a big problem. That that celestial navigation wasn't very good, and so um, the kind of accuracy you could get with like mechanical clocks, you know, you'd have to know what time it is so that you know where your reference is, and the kind of accuracy you could get in in those days was like. Uh, 10 to the minus third. So, which meaning again, given the, the 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 speed at which the Earth is spinning, hundreds of kilometers you could be off if you're using that method. So, the British recognized this uh, in the 18th century. In fact, you know, the, the, we know we refer to Greenwich Mean Time because uh, it was established. That's where our um, oh, uh, the Greenwich uh, uh, Naval Observatory is where we've established the prime meridian. The longitude prime meridian because they were very, um, very much uh, uh, that, that's what they were they were uh, trying to establish where we are in longitude, um, and so in fact, 
as a side note, if, if most most of us navigation geeks have uh, visited that nice museum uh, there, you you can stand at the museum, you can see uh, some of the um, old mechanical clocks that they used to use, and and uh, actually stand across the prime meridian, take your picture of that you've been in zero zero. But um, but but uh, I'll, I'll that I digress. I'll I'll get back to the to the subject here. So so here we are in the 18th century and. The, um, the 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 British Naval Observatory awards a prize to say who can build the best clock um, to to solve this problem we have and, and they did this uh, this chap named uh, Harrison built this clock uh, in, in 1750s he's actually about three different uh, versions but he uh, won the prize and is able to increase accuracy by two orders of magnitude which is pretty impressive and getting him in, into the you know few kilometer accuracy so so that was a that was a big plus um so now we get to the 20th century we have quartz technology and you know in your in your phones and your watches and stuff since since then you can get you can get you know um uh, very good, ten to the minus six type accuracy. So if you're if you're still doing celestial navigation, you could you could even use your clock, your your watch, and use that. Of course, by the second half of the 20th century, we now have atomic clocks, and and we can do much better. And 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 in fact, that might be a subject for a, another webinar some some other time. Um, but now let's um, so let's let's take a look at now. Um, uh, what does what does all that have to do with our GNSS system? So, uh, uh, if if you look, we satellites. It's 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 not very old. Um, uh, the first satellite was launched uh, the year I was born, so I, I don't think of that as being that long ago. Some of you might think it's it's older, but um, the uh, so uh, we we get the 1957, we get the first satellite. 1967 is when we uh, we we really uh, adapt the uh, things of, of measuring time by atomic clocks. We've even we've even redefined a second. Uh, now, at that point, uh, saying, "Okay, we're, it's no longer the movement of the of the Earth, uh, the, what we call the the, the uh, astronomical uh, ways of measuring time. We we use uh, um, atomic uh, atomic theory to measure time, and it's an extremely accurate way of doing it. We we come up with what's called universal coordinated time, which is through through treaties of 190 countries all signed." Treaty at that time to say, hey, we'll we'll, we'll agree on, on on using that for time. So now we have we have that um, a great way to measure time. Uh, we have way of putting satellites up. So the the GPS system is born in, in the 80s. And so uh, this is many of you in the audience I know already know about um, G, GPS and GNSS systems. But for some of you that are new to this, I'll just quickly explain how. Uh, uh, GPS works is are all the GNSS systems. What they do, the, the the satellites don't know where you are. They're not tracking you. Uh, they are just transmitting a pulse or the equivalent electronic equivalent of a pulse, a a high correlation peak thing there. But it's the equivalent of a of a pulse, and they're transmitting it once every second, all exactly at the same time. And when I say exactly, I mean within within less than a nanosecond of synchronization. They all transmit that pulse at exactly the same time. You on Earth with your receiver, you receive those pulses at different times based on how far away you are from the satellites. So you can measure your distance by measuring those time differences. You can measure those 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 uh, the, your distance to the satellites. You know where the satellites are because they tell you where they are in their data messages, and so you can then uh, triangulate and determine where you are. You 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 have four unknowns in this situation: uh, x, y, and z, where you are, and time. You just know that they're all doing it at the same time; that their differential is near zero, but you don't know what time it is. So if you get four independent measurements, four unknowns, you can solve. For position and time, so that's that's how that's how it works, and and so uh, that's why we can all, we measure both position and time off of these GNS uh, uh, systems. Very accurate. 
Um, it, prior to the year 2000, the GPS system wasn't that accurate. Uh, we had the, the U.S. military put in this actual noise capability um, that, that uh, uh, on, uh, only the military uh, could avoid. Well, in the year 2000, uh, Cold War is over. They decide to turn that off. And so then even us civilians are now able to get this high accuracy. And so here we are today, as we said, we not only have the GPS system, but uh, all of these, uh, these, these, these other three very good, very, very accurate systems. So, so that's where we are. And so companies like us at, at Arolia and other companies um, use, it will use the GNSS signals uh, not only for positioning, but for time, this precise time, taking advantage that you've got these uh, very, uh, very good atomic clocks um, circling the Earth, as, as someone else had pointed out, um, you know, over 100 now uh, 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 pointing uh, with um, pr uh, transmitting precise time to the Earth. So um, you can take a device, and pick to, we call it a, a time and frequency server, which you um, extract the time from these GNSS signals and then Put it to use. Put it, extract the time and the first derivative of time, which is frequency, and and put it to use for synchronizing things. You synchronize data centers, all the distributed processing that we're doing by processing things in the cloud. Uh, Google is is all of its servers needing to to synchronize things together. So you you do that. Uh, anything that transmits a signal that that is. Um, uh, uh, a receiver transmitter, a, a, a radar, a, a, a digital TV transmitter, the cellular base station transmitter. They need precise frequency and precise time. And so this is a, a great way of doing it. And lastly, power grid. There's several others, but these are the main ones. The power grid, synchronizing, synchronizing the uh, power distribution across the grid. So, um, so now, um, I always say the, the the GNSS signals are great. They're very accurate. They're wonderful when you can get them. The big problem is 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 they're being broadcast from 20,000 kilometers above the Earth's surface. The signal when you receive it on Earth is very weak. It's very weak. So it's two main problems. Is one, it, it's very, it makes it very easy to jam either unintentionally or intentionally from some bad guy. And number two, these are open systems, at least the civilian ones that we're all using. And and um, and uh, so uh, you, you, it can be spoofed. Some people can uh, can make a fake uh, a fake signal and, and fool you. So um, the, those are the the two main problems. So what do we do about? It? How do we refer to making things more resilient? So with a, with a time situation. One of the things we do is we, we we install what we call a holdover oscillator, and, and atomic clocks are are no longer um, these exotic devices, but they're actually commercially practical, becoming very small and affordable. So in our time service, we'll put in even an atomic clock holdover oscillator, so that even if the GNSS signal gets interrupted, you can still carry on. You've 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 disciplined or, or phase locked that your local oscillator to the GNSS signal so that if it disappears, you could still maintain time. Um, uh, the other thing we do, and, and, and Sunil had, had touched on it, and you'll hear a lot more uh, about this from um, Julian in the next talk, is is um, using um, we call smart antennas, anti-jam antennas. In fact, we use the talisman antennas very good. The fact that, uh, as Sunil showed, the um, uh, you you can put uh, elevation blocking uh, at the at the horizon, still pick up because there's so many satellites, still pick up a, a, a very good GNSS signal. But blocking the horizon, that's where most interference is coming from. Most interference is terrestrial based. So if you block the horizon, um, you, you can you can do things really well there. And and then even from that, there are uh, even um, uh, um, other other tracking antennas, we call them some real smart antennas, which will um, automatically steer a null towards an interference, or maybe um, uh, make a high gain 
um, directional beams of which track the satellites as they go across the sky. So uh, all these kinds of things that typically are, those are called SERPA antennas, controlled radiation pattern antennas that you can, can electrically control. But um, uh, in, oh, I, I did say um, uh, uh, encrypted, encrypted uh, signals are not available to the civilian world. That's been true. Up until now, the Galileo system is uh, offering, I guess, for civilian use, what they call the um, OSNMA, the, the uh, NAV message authentication. And so that way you can, much the way um, uh, HTTPS is, is, is authenticated when you're, when you're uh, on a website, a similar uh, idea to do that with the navigation messages that you're hearing. So I think we'll be seeing that um, uh, available soon, but that gives you a measure, measure of protection. Um, um, so lastly, let's talk about not only uh, multi-constellation, but also multi-frequencies. What, what are the what are the advantages from from this point of view? Um, Sennel had showed a, a number of advantages in the navigation, the improved um, uh, GDOP, PDOP um, uh, advantages. Um, in general, if you use more frequencies, more of these frequency bands, um, it'll be harder to jam. The the bad guy now needs to jam three different frequencies instead of just one. So so there's an advantage there. Or interference, unintentional interference, tends to not tends to be just in one band. It doesn't tend to be in it'd be a unique circumstance of where it's being in all bands. Um, the the the, besides all the advantages that you heard before about, about multi constellations, the other thing is that there's a glitch in these in, in w any one system, and it's not unheard of. You know, in, in 2016, the GPS system had a glitch. Um, was it uh, two two years ago? The Galileo system had a glitch in it. Think that things will happen like that. So you get more diversity, more more resilience that way if there's a fault in any one system. Um, on, on, on the negative side, the um, the part of the um, that they're all in the same band makes it uh, if you it is it is easy it's, it's still easy to jam. It's not that much different. So if one gets jammed, uh, all of those signals, all those constellations are getting uh, in that band are getting jammed. So so there's a there's an issue there. And the other thing is, I want to say, okay, if you have you have more complexity it, it, if someone wants to spoof you and uh, you're using all four GNSS systems, they'll have to spoof all four of them. So that's, that's, that makes their job harder. But on the other hand, the simulators, and, and we know this because we build simulators, we build good ones, um, uh, that they're getting better all the time. They can. It, it is possible to simulate all of them simultaneously. So, so, so those are those are the main things you've heard about the difference in, in time scales. So it's something to to remember uh, whenever you're using multi constellations, uh, knowing that each each constellation has its own unique um, time scale. So when you're working down at the nanosecond level, you want to um, want to be aware of that. So that's all I'm seeing. I'm I'm starting to go a little over time. So with that, I'll stop and uh, turn it over to uh, Julien. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, hello, everybody. I am uh, Julia Hooker, and I'm the director of the GNSS product R&D at Talisman Wireless. And I'm going to continue this presentation, concentrating more on the antenna aspect of multi-constellation and multi-signal uh, multi GNSS. So just a brief word on Talisman. Uh, Talisman is a Canadian-based company. We are part today of the Kalian Group, and since the beginning, we are manufacture precision GNSS antennas. Um, we have a wide, broad catalog uh, from affordable dual band to reference grade antennas. And uh, our mission from the beginning has to be to reduce the cost uh, by design. The idea is that like um, during the last 10, 15 years, uh, we saw the cost of uh, receivers going down. And it makes sense that the cost of the antenna would follow, but we try to do this without compromising on the precision. So um, what is the importance of the antenna? Um, one thing we'd like to remind to our customer is the GNSS antenna is just, I mean, just is the first component of your GNSS system. 
So if the antenna uh, receives interferences, if it produces noise, shift phases, there is a very limited amount of things that the receiver can do to recover signal degradation. So the Genesis antenna is just the first line of difference of your system. This is why the antenna design choice installation is really critical and should be done wisely. But what's a Genesis antenna? Um, so inside we have two main components. We have a radiating element, which uh, is a passive component, and we have uh, what we call the low noise amplifier, or LNA, which is an active component. And they both will play a role uh, in this uh, signal processing. First, uh, the passive uh, radiating element will receive the wave from the satellites, and it will amplify or attenuate depending on this gain in radiation pattern and transmit the signal to the LNA, which will also amplify perhaps add noise depending on noise figure, and um, we'll also have some like different characteristics to look at, like the saturation point of rejection. When this is done, the signal is uh, sent to the receiver. So what is the role of the antenna? Um, typically, the radiating element and the LNA will work as a team. And the idea is to do two main things. First thing is to maximize what we call the G over T, which is the gain of the antenna over the noise temperature of the receiver. And the idea is to amplify the carrier to noise ratio um, to make it higher as possible. So we're going to amplify the GNSS signals and limit the inband noise. Um, the other main thing to do is to protect the receivers from any out-of-band or in-band rejection and transmit clean Genesis information. So for that, we're going to try to attenuate out-of-band interference, and um, if, we can, if we cannot attenuate them because they will be in-band, we're going to try to limit saturation and, and stay uh, in the linear mode of the LNA. So what are the antenna requirements um, for having a good Genesis antenna? First, the key thing is to have the right polarization. The polarization from the satellite is the right-hand polarized, which means the antenna uh, should be designed in order to receive only right-hand polarized. This is different from linear antennas, like which is used for like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, cell phone, things like that. Uh, here we're talking about like a circular polarization. And in this situation, it's right-hand circular. The left-hand circular is also important because we want to reject it. And the reason for that is like when uh, signals are not arriving directly to the antenna and they bounce against buildings or trees around the, in the environment around the antenna, they will affect uh, the circularity uh, of the polarization and they could flip the, the circularity and become more left-hand of elliptical. So by, in fact, rejecting the left-hand polarized signal, we're going to reduce the multipath effect on the antenna and get a cleaner signal. We also want to have a high efficiency and a low noise figure. So this is related to the aspects I talked before about maximizing the G over T. Um, for modern application today, like RTK of PPP, one key thing is to also minimize what we call the PCV, the phase center variation. So the phase center is a point in space where uh, the signal are uh, arriving and received at the antenna. And this point in space uh, is, in fact, moving uh, depending on the elevation angle and depending on frequency. So as it moves, typically it will um, change, induce a phase error in the signal. So it's very important if you want to have a, a precise measurement of where you are to have this point to be as fixed as possible because this point is typically the beginning of your tape measure between your uh, antenna and the satellite. So you want to minimize that uh, phase center variation. And another key thing, which seems obvious, is to reject any out-of-band uh, interfering signal. So at the beginning, like uh, Sunil and John said, we had just a uh, dual signal on GPS, uh, two frequencies, uh, one at 1575 and the other one at 1227 megahertz. Today, we are talking about multi-constellation with um, four different constellations and plenty of signals. So the antenna needs to adapt. We need now multi-constellation antennas. So everything we talked about, the antenna requirements, still has to apply not only for L1 and L2, but it has to apply for a much wider uh, frequency range. So we need um, to keep an antenna which is uh, as performant as before on a wider frequency range in order to uh, keep the same performance, same uh, quality of reception, and uh, for um, a higher GNSS robustness. So at the beginning, let's go back. Uh, what were the solutions? Um, we had two frequencies. We could use like, uh, like a standard stack patch, compact things, uh, with like dual feed in order to uh, minimize multipath, 
and by um, using those patch uh, are quite good because um, the frequency range you're trying to cover is quite small, so you can maximize the efficiency by tuning your, your, your antenna at the right frequencies. And uh, if we see here the efficiency variation of the frequency, we can see that we have a peak of efficiency uh, just on L1 and L2, and we get just good results and your system is fine. But now if we go onto GNSS, we are widening the frequency range. And now you can see that the efficiency or your antenna is not constant uh, over frequency, and this is where you're going to start to lose quality of the signal if you're tracking more signals over more frequencies. So what does that mean? It means that we need to look at new antennas, and especially new antenna technologies. Um, you can use bigger patches, so bigger patches will increase the bandwidth of smaller, compared to smaller patches. You can go to uh, helix antennas, and you can also go to um, antennas which would be perhaps dipole-based. Uh, we can see on this graph the different type of efficiency uh, versus frequency that you can get uh, from Helix patch and uh, our VeroStar technology, which is dipole-based technology, which is the one which keeps the best performance in terms of efficiency versus frequency. Um, but here the big challenge is that um, the, the frequency you're going to receive uh, depends on the wavelength, and like uh, Sunil mentioned, the wavelength uh, is about like um, 190 millimeters, around like 20 centimeters. So to reduce the antenna, uh, you, you, you reduce the size, you will typically change the wavelength. So the challenge is how to keep the same frequency response by reducing the antenna. So we have, to, we have techniques to do that. Uh, things are changing uh, every year, and we introduce new antennas. But today, we, we are able to propose like different packages and different formats to be able to receive multi-constellation and multi-signal. Um, we are working today on a low-height uh, full-band uh, helical, because people always want something smaller and more compact. Um, but this is one of the key challenges of antennas today. Another thing we talked about interferences. So, Again, at the beginning, when we're just getting over L1 and L2, uh, perhaps interfering signal were a bit further on the frequency range and were not really affecting the signal uh, of the GNSS, so that was fine. But now we are widening um, the uh, GNSS spectrum, and now we're getting more and more closer to a really strong signal, which are terrestrial signals like Iridium uh, 1616 to 1626, or Ligado, which is a recently added signal, which we from 1525 to 1536, and we can talk about like Japanese LT, there are also new LT signal in Europe today, which are jamming all the system. Uh, we have new compliance to met, like red compliance, which are forcing rejections of, of uh, uh, amplification, the LNA, for specific signals. So this needs to be taken into account when now we're designing the antenna. What does that mean? It means we have to work on the filtering of, of, of the LNA. So the idea would be probably to uh, cascade filters. And this works when you cascade filters, you uh, increase the rejection out of band. Uh, and this, this works fine, but you have to be careful because uh, now you're going to probably uh, look at some trade-offs. And I will go in details just after that. But the idea is like usually we're going to try to go now on custom filters. We're going to be made for specific antenna and, and, uh, and uh, band or perhaps also area in the world which have specific signals. But by looking at custom filters, we have better control of noise figure, the rejection levels, and group delay variations, and temperature of uh, temperature variation of the filters. Um, if you look at the little bit in the details, like if I'm cascading filters, I said I get better rejection and sharpness, and sharpness is important if the interfering signal is very close to the GNSS spectrum. But by doing this, I also degrade um, the flatness of the gain in band, for example. Uh, we are amplifying the imperfection of a filter by putting two or three in a row. Uh, same thing with the group delay. If I need a, group, a flat group delay over a specific spectrum, like, for example, GLONASS, which would be very uh, sensitive to that, uh, adding more filters, I amplify the group delay variation, and here I'm introducing issues. Um, if my filter vary uh, in frequency, the, frequency, the response vary in frequency, I can now start to be... Uh, not rejecting interfering signals which are very close. That's why we need to keep an eye on all those aspects when you design uh, your LNA. Here an example uh, for about the importance of the group delay stability. Um, we talked about GLONASS just like uh, between the band like uh, 1598 and 1606, and we'd like to minimize those group delay variations. For example, here is a group delay 
with a variation of a frequency for uh, an antenna we had, um, which has good rejection, um, but we had a group delay variation of a G1 of about nine nanoseconds and a dif differential group delay, which is uh, the group delay variation between L1 and L2 of about eight nanoseconds. And this is important for ionosphere corrections, for example. But uh, if you want to just add filters on this antenna in order to have better rejection, what's happening if, for example, I add a filter on L1, suddenly the group delay over L1 is increased. And now I have a group delay over G1 is almost doubled. I go 19 nanoseconds instead of nine. And for the differential group delay, I go from uh, eight nanoseconds to now 25. So, so, so this has a huge impact on, on um, the performance of the antenna and the system. So this is things that have to be looked out when you design the antennas. Let's talk about another aspect, and John mentioned it a little bit, is about like uh, radiation pattern shaping. Um, the idea comes from the fact that most of the interfering signal come from the ground, so it means low elevation angles. So we're going to try to, in fact, uh, attenuate um, the ground plane, uh, attenuate excuse me, the radiation pattern at low elevation angle in order to attenuate the response to those interference. So here is the design of uh, L1 antenna, which is an anti-jamming system, and uh, we tried to reduce the gain of the antenna at an elevation of 10 degrees uh, by about like 25 dB. And uh, this has for effect that uh, all the interfering signals have been attenuated. So this antenna has been tested on, on a roof close to a truck facility, and with a standard antenna over a period of eight days, we lost the signal for about an hour and a half, where with this solution, we just lost the signal for 41 seconds. So this was very efficient in a way to prevent uh, interfering signal. And we're always working today on the L1, L2, L5 antenna because we're definitely talking about a multi-constellation and multi-signal world. So as a conclusion, I would say that um, the choice of the GNSS antenna uh, to use is very, very critical. Um, Multi-GNSS and uh, multi-signal, we're talking about wideband antenna uh, for those modern applications. We're going to have to look at new technologies if we want to keep a high efficiency, uh, good circularity, and small phase centers. Um, controlling and customing the filters is, is more and more important today um, in order to protect against interferences, control group delay variation and temperature variation. And uh, looking at uh, radiation patterns shaping is also a solution that could be used in some situation. Just as a wrap up of the three presentation, um, I would say that multi-constellation, multi-GNSS uh, has existed now for a few years and uh, but not everybody has updated it. So the question is why an L1 user should go L1 and L2, or, or why an L1 and L2 should go L1 and L2, L5? Why should we go to multi-constellation and multi-GNSS? Um, so we think that um, it's needed in a case where you want a more precise, a more accurate, and faster system, and would perform still very good in more complicated, uh, complicated environment all over the globe. You will usually be more resilient and more robust, um, it's true that the complexity uh, increases, but today the technologies are evolving and solutions are already here. So if you ask us if it's worth the effort of the cost, we definitely think yes. And on that, I will uh, give it back to Mackenzie. Thank you. Great. All right. At this time, we are going to jump into some questions we received during registration and a couple we got during the presentation. All right, my first question is for Sanil. What's the five-year outlook into the future for GNSS? Um, thanks, Mackenzie. Uh, it, it's a good question. It's a very broad question. But I, what I would say following on um, Julian's last comments is that we're seeing uh, what, more, of, uh, more of an acceleration of what we've been seeing over the last few years, uh, more multi-constellation, uh, more multi-frequency, uh, greater adoption of what we would have called the professional grade um, hardware, antennas, receivers, and, 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 and software um, into more and more uh, mass market applications. So uh, further transition into multi-constellation, multi-frequency, and uh, further uh, penetration of higher performances in more mass market applications. That's a general answer, um, but it's a very broad question. And if others would like to, to, to uh, chime in, please go ahead. 
I think I think you covered it, Sunil. Yeah. Okay. My next question is for John. Um, what is the accuracy of a timing offset between a different constellation? Ah, okay. Yeah, as we mentioned there, the you know each constellation is using a different time base. Now the differences are in the order. You know, we're talking nanosecond, sub nanosecond uh, type issues, but uh, they will go into your um, your your error budget. Uh, so it's a it's a rather uh, complex thing. I guess I I can't say exactly what it is. You, they it's a it's a time varying thing. Um, I guess a, just two points to remind people would be one. You know, e, uh, each constellation is um, giving you information of how it compares to UTC, the Universal uh, Coordinated Time. So that's a, a a more generalized time base used throughout the world, and then each constellation uses its own thing. So you have GPS time, you have Galileo time, et cetera. And so you have to, there's a comparison between those. And um, I guess the the other thing is the behavior of the receiver themselves. Um, the newer receivers, the multi-constellation receivers, uh, some of them are allowing you to set which time base you want to use. Uh, but if you switch from one to other, there's some modes that uh, may not be enabled, and and so I guess it just to to thing I could say is it, it it it's it's in the um, it's in the nanosecond sub nanosecond area of the differences, but there are even um, calculation things of where you might not be able to use certain modes because of these different time bases. Interesting. Okay, my next question is for Julian. How can we build low power receivers one to two MAB with multiband GNSS? Um, so on this question, uh, for the receivers, I won't be the specialist here, but I can say that uh, for antennas, uh, we are able to uh, limit uh, the current consumption of antennas. And this is a rule we try to, to do at Talisman is uh, we're trying to use uh, low current consumption uh, LNAs in order to minimize the consumption of, of the full system. And we, we, we already developed in the past like very low consumption uh, um, antennas, like uh, just using like two milliamps for like single frequency antennas. But today we are able to do like triple band antennas and I think uh, we're just using about 12 milliamps. So this is the aspect. Uh, on the receiver side now, I, I won't be uh, the person to answer that because uh, we're not building receiver directly at Talisman. Okay. Um, my next question is for Sunil. How does multi constellation GNSS help or not help in heavy tree canopy? Um, interesting question. Um, so what we showed uh, earlier in the webinar were examples of uh, just uh, of binary situations where you either had uh, a signal blockage or no signal blockage. And what we would see uh, in, in tree canopies, uh, depending how thick they are, uh, the situation isn't as binary. It's more fuzzy. So the real benefit comes um, from, I mean, if it's very, very heavily tree canopy, uh, we're, we're going to have problems. But if, if the canopy is thinner and some signals uh, can make it, make it through, the benefit of the multi-constellation multi-frequency is that we would, uh, depending on what your performance specifications were, we would be able to receive enough signals to produce a, uh, a reasonably precise uh, solution, a positioning solution. Uh, one of the other benefits uh, with some of the frequencies that I've mentioned, for example, GPS L5, is is it's transmitted at a higher frequency, so, uh, higher sorry, higher amplitude. So, uh, with uh, with some of the signals, uh, th there will be um, a higher uh, percentage of the signals that will receive be received and be able to be acquired, sensed by the antenna and acquired by the receiver. So there there are benefits. Um, uh, in terms of the the number of frequencies, the, the specific frequencies, and and just the sheer number of measurements that uh, you're able to to try to acquire and track. Great. All right. My next question is for John. 
how is regulation likely to evolve for the establishment of standards for resilient PNT in the U.S. and worldwide? Oh, okay. Um, I guess I could maybe speak for the U.S. and at least what, what I, I see going on in, in the U.S. right now. Um, some of you may be aware uh, last year a, an executive order came out from the White House of, of telling our our critical infrastructure um, uh, components in, in other agencies across the United States uh, for aviation, for for the power grid, for for the telecommunications, for for financial institutions, an order that said they they need to build in resilience and any when using PNT services from from GPS. And so um, our Department of Homeland Security had come out with. Uh, an actual standard, a framework for resilience to define what do, do we mean, and they define like four levels of resilience. So it's, it's a real nice standard. Um, our, our NIST, the National Institute of Science and Technology, that establishes a lot of our technical standards, come up with some cybersecurity standards. They do that, and also for for uh, how to protect against. GNSS. So it's a pretty involved um, topic. I guess I could uh, point people to, if you visit our website, we've done a number of actually uh, webinars on this subject, and you could uh, listen to those webinars if you visit the Aurelia website. Okay. Julian, I have another question for you. Is there any use case where L1 has advantages over L5? Um. In this situation, I would say that to me, the, one of the advantages I see today is uh, I think there is still a lot more L1 satellites in the sky compared to L5. So it's true that L5 has more uh, power, but um, the L1 satellites are still the, the natural uh, uh, signal that, that goes with every receiver as far as I know. Uh, and usually when we're talking about multi-frequency, it starts with L1. So we're talking about L1, L2, or L1, L5. We're also talking today about like some L1, L6. So uh, it's difficult to have L1 being removed. I think there is companies working on L5-only receivers I've heard of, uh, but have not been involved uh, really with this directly. So um, uh, I'd be interested to know why some people would not use L1. Uh, but uh, up to now, I think it, it's one of the major signals, and uh, I think it's still going to be used for many, many times. Okay, great. That is all the time we have for questions. Um, so to just round it out, thank you for attending today's webinar. It's about time, PNT challenges and benefits of multi-constellation and multi-signal GNSS, brought to you by GPS World Magazine and our sponsor of the event, Talisman. If you have any additional questions for myself or our speakers, you can reach out to us directly via the email addresses you see on the screen. A recording of this webinar will be emailed to you tomorrow and posted to gpsworld.com slash webinars. Upcoming webinars from GPS World will also be posted to that page. Thank you all for attending, and we hope you'll join us for another great webinar.